Introducing The Secret to Victory, a new branded podcast from Gatorade and Gimlet Creative about how the best athletes in the world use defeat to fuel a win. I'm not supposed to lose, ever. We lost 13 in my rookie season. It was definitely a humbling year. I'm host Dominique Foxworth. On The Secret to Victory, we'll hear from Serena Williams, Matt Ryan, Peyton Manning, and more. The Secret to Victory is out now. Visit Gatorade.com slash podcast to listen now. Or subscribe on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Hi, I'm Pat Walters. And before we get started, I just wanted to tell you that the idea for this show came out of conversations with our friends at Retro Report, the documentary film series that connects iconic news events of the past to today. You can check them out at RetroReport.org. From Gimlet Media, I'm Pat Walters, and this is Undone. Undone is a show about how big news stories we thought were over often were the beginning of something else. We'll go back to one of these stories each episode and tell you about the surprising things that happened when everybody stopped looking. This is our first episode, and it starts on a hot summer night in Chicago, Illinois, July 12th, 1979. It's a makeup game. It rained earlier in the year, and we lost the game with Detroit, so this is a makeup game. It's a four game We're at Comiskey now. Park on the south side of Chicago, and the White Sox are playing a doubleheader against the Detroit Tigers. The place was packed. They completely sold out the stadium, and there were another 20,000 people wandering around in the street trying to get in. There were that many people who couldn't even get in. Yeah, yeah. They were, ever, they were climbing the drain pipes. This is Paul Natkin. He was there that night. But he wasn't there for the baseball game. Nobody was really there for the baseball game. They were there for this promotion that was being put on by a big rock radio station in town called The Loop. If you brought a disco record, you got in for 98 cents. Now, the thing you have to understand is, disco was everywhere that summer. The station said, bring your Anita Ward, your sister Sledge, your Donna Summer, Bring all the disco music you can find so that we can destroy it. Disco sucks! Disco sucks! This was supposed to be a wacky stunt, but it ended up becoming something so much bigger than that. It became this huge thing. Front page of the Sun-Times, front page of the Tribune. It made worldwide news. It's a trivial pursuit question. This week, we're going back to this night, where 50,000 people showed up to a baseball game in Chicago to rage against disco music. We've spent the past several months sifting through the craziness of that night, trying to make sense of what happened. We found out a lot. And along the way, we came across a guy named Vince Lawrence, an usher at the game, whose story shows how this night connects to so much of the music we listen to today. To get things going, here's Vince, the usher. Well, when I got there, you know, we set up at the gates as usual, and there were lines around the block. And there's- Vince was 15 that summer, and he'd gotten a job with this company that provided ushers to big venues in Chicago. Take a guy to his seat, watch the concert. Not a bad job. He'd gotten to see lots of shows. ABBA, Michael Jackson, Kiss, um, the Funk Fest at Soldier Field. I saw the Rolling Stones with this um, incredible guy, Prince, opening for him. And this would have been amazing for any kid, but it was especially so for Vince because he decided recently that he was going to be a musician. It had happened when his dad's friend took him to see this funk artist named Captain Sky, whose band had a synthesizer in it. And at that point, that's what I was going to do. I was going to be the synthesizer guy. Which was a pretty new thing at the time. And that's why he took this usher job, to save money to buy his first synthesizer. So, on this night, it's not a concert, it's a baseball game. Or it was supposed to be anyway. Vince is out at the front gate. Taking tickets, watching records pile up at the gate. And I had strict intention of keeping disco records that I thought were good that I didn't have. (laughs) So Vince is a disco fan, taking tickets at an anti-disco event. Which sounds like it'd be a real bummer. But Vince says he was actually really excited to be working that night because the DJ hosting the promotion was someone that he liked. I knew about Steve Dahl and Teenage Radiation, his band. 
and I thought that they were pretty cool. Steve Dahl is the DJ at The Loop, the big rock radio station that was putting on this promotion of the baseball game. And Vince says he had this band that did parodies of disco songs. My name is Tony. Did you care to dance? No? Hey, calm down. Let me get you another pina colada. He did this cover of Do You Think I'm Sexy by Rod Stewart. Which Vince noticed had some synthesizer in it. So I was like, wow, you know, he's cool. He's a, he's a futurist, just like me. But unlike Vince, Steve Dahl had been on this anti-disco crusade that summer, making fun of disco on his radio show, doing public appearances where he'd smash disco records over his head. And that night at the baseball game, his plan was to blow up all the disco records people brought to the stadium. But as Vince was sifting through these records as he was collecting them at the gate, he noticed something strange. A lot of them weren't actually disco records. Well, there's Marvin Gaye records and Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life, records that were black records. And I was like, you can't get in to people who have tickets because I'm like, this record isn't a disco record. You have to have a disco record to get in for a dollar. But his boss came over and said no. He says, look, if they bring a record, if it's in that area, you got to let them in. Which Vince says he thought was weird, but at the time, he really didn't think that much of it. So... The first game starts. It's a doubleheader, so there's two games. And that first one is pretty uneventful. Diane White, another person who was in the crowd that night. I, I wouldn't say it was like a mood of riotousness during, you know, the game. But after that first game ended... Things changed. This big door opened in center field, and the Jeep rolled out. That's Paul Natkin again. Like a World War II Jeep with the top down, you know, where they had the canvas tops. And Steve Dahl, the anti-disco DJ, was standing in the back, shouting into a megaphone. Hey, it's because of you that this is happening tonight, okay? Not because of us. We're merely a vehicle for your thoughts. Disco sucks. Disco sucks. He was wearing his ROTC jacket and um, Hawaiian shirt. With the army helmet. People are screaming and they're going nuts. And Steve Dahl pulls the Jeep up next to a dumpster. Do you have any sense of how many were in there? It was a big dumpster and it was full. Well, listen, we took all the disco records that you brought tonight. We got them in a giant box and we're going to blow them up real good. And this was the big moment that all those people had come to see that night. All of a sudden, there's like stuff shooting up in the air. Crowd goes out of their minds. I was working the boxes along the third baseline. We were very quickly overrun because there just weren't enough of us. They're, they're getting out of their seats and they're jumping onto the field. Thousands of people storming the field. And at first, it all looks pretty fun. You see kids chasing each other around, sliding in the grass, climbing on each other's shoulders. I talked to this newspaper reporter named Dave Hoekstra who was there who told me the owner was out on the field. And he was old and he had a peg leg and there's there's stories about him. Yeah, yeah, he lost his leg in the war. And he kept getting stuck in the mud. The whole thing is like this zany real life slapstick routine until all of a sudden it's just not. People started ripping up the bases, the batting cages. All hell broke loose. All of a sudden, you see a cloud of smoke. Right. What happened was that uh, they van stormed the field and they set a bonfire in center field. And, they also and people are dancing field. around it. Yelling disco sucks. There's a section behind the bullpen where some people lit the um, seats on fire. The seats so in the stands on fire? Yeah. Yeah. I was standing on the field with our uh, camera crew shooting this, and it was one of the most horrifying sights you can imagine. Steve Dahl, the, the disc jockey, was nowhere to be found. Uh, the game delayed over two hours. Jim. Yes, what's the, what's the current situation? They just canceled the second game. My chief usher came to me and says, hey, they're telling us that we have to go home. They're calling the police to protect the park. Police have actually set up barricades now to keep people out of the area of the stadium. Rosemary Gully is there with a live report. So at this point, Vince is just trying to get out of there. And on my way to the locker room, there were just angry people 
running up to me, getting in my face, saying, disco sucks, disco sucks. And I remember saying, hey, look at my shirt. He was wearing a T-shirt with the logo of The Loop, the rock station that had put on the event that night. And I had to show him, like, hey, I'm not, I'm, hey, I'm, I'm not, you know, a bad person. Look at my shirt. Feeling like um, they thought I was disco. And a kid came up to me and took a 12-inch disc and broke it right in my face. It was like a Marvin Gaye 12-inch or something like that. And I didn't understand it until much later that, you know, that was just hate. And that um, they were directing it at me because I was Black and the record was Black. I didn't get that at that time. By the end of the night, 39 people had been arrested. The cops even had to bring in horses. And this became a huge news story. And the pictures of it that went all around the world are disturbing. You see a crowd of thousands of white kids out on this field, smashing and burning records by primarily black artists. And to a lot of people who saw those images in the paper and watched them on television the next day, this didn't look like a wacky radio stunt. It looked really, it looked a little scary to me, actually. It looked really frightening. This is Renee Graham. She's a columnist for the Boston Globe who writes about music and culture. But when all this happened, she was a teenager. What it reminded me of even then was I remember seeing films of these sort of white citizens councils in the 50s who disliked rock and roll. Now, what they really disliked is the fact that this was a music that was bringing together blacks and whites. Renee says the backlash against disco seemed similar. This wasn't just, oh, we don't like this music. This, was, this wasn't just that. This was, we don't like these people who listen to this music. And to understand that, you really have to go back to the roots of disco, to June of 1969 in New York City. Renee says it all started in the wake of the riot at the Stonewall Inn, when the cops started scaling back their raids on gay bars in the city. It wasn't like the old days where the windows were blacked out and there was no name on the door and you had to know where it was. Suddenly, places were quite open. You know, I can remember going to one of the big, big clubs in the 70s downtown. I was probably, I don't know, 16 years old, so I really had no business being there anyway. And I wasn't and I wasn't out. So going to those those clubs was, I felt like I had I had come home. As a gay woman of color, these clubs became a safe place for Renee and for lots of people. They called the clubs discos because everybody was dancing to records instead of a band. And at first they were dancing to all different kinds of music, funk, soul, R&B. But then in the early 1970s, a new style of music started coming out. This is Love Train. Came out in 1972 by a band called the OJs. It's one of the first disco songs. And Renee says she remembers hearing disco music and thinking, It was clearly different from all the R&B and soul I'd been listening to up to that point. It had some elements of that other music. You know, the bulk of the artists who were out there got their start singing in church. So these were church-trained voices. Big gospel-trained, you know, black voices. But it also pulled in all this other stuff. Salsa, which was really big in New York in the 1970s, put behind it usually, you know, an orchestra. A lot of percussion. With the drums, it's like that hissing sound, that But the most defining element, the thing that was new and really set disco apart from the things before it, was the beat. You have to have, say, 120 beats per minute. It was just a lot faster than music before that. It was a little like R&B, but on steroids. They called it four on the floor, which just means that the music was written in 4-4 four, four time, four beats per measure, and where the drummer would hit the bass drum on every single downbeat. You know, there was something about the propulsion of that sound that was really intoxicating. This beat was brand new, even though it's such a simple idea. And the thing about this beat is that it just made you dance. That was the thing different from a lot of the other music. You could sing along to other things, you could dance, but disco was built to be danced to. And because of that, disco took over the gay dance clubs that were flourishing in New York and other big cities across the country, like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago. And as it spread, the music got woven together with the movement for gay rights, for openness, for inclusivity. 
The music became the culture. And by the mid-70s, disco had made it out of the gay clubs and into the homes of teenagers like Vince, the usher we talked to before. There was disco on the radio and disco in my house. This is Ring My Bell by Anita Ward, and it would later become one of Vince's favorite songs. The reason I remember that record so much at that time was because it had that one syndrome sound. And I learned how to make that sound at Captain Sky's rehearsals. Through 73, 74, and 75, the scene kept growing, but it didn't quite go mainstream. If you wanted to hear disco, you were listening to uh, the black radio stations. Nobody else was playing it. And then in 1977... Hey, Tony! How you doing? Okay. Saturday Night Fever comes out, and disco is everywhere. Everyone was wearing polyester white suits, and the Bee Gees were all you heard. Nothing against the Bee Gees. More and more Americans are getting more and more into the disco scene was this trendy thing, and suddenly people started flooding into discos who had never gone to discos before. This is the scene outside a New York disco called Studio 54. This is it was almost like musical gentrification, if you will. Um, kind of pushing, you know, the pioneers and the originators out of the way and letting in all these new people who then decide it's their thing and that they created it. And not only was everybody listening to disco music, everybody seemed to be making it, too. This is the Rolling Stones. Rod Stewart had a disco song. By the spring of 1979, there were 20,000 disco clubs in America. Nearly half the Grammy Awards that year went to disco music, and dozens of huge mainstream radio stations, stations that previously played rock music, switched formats to play disco 24 hours a day. So this is what's happening in 1979. And just a couple months later, The Loop and Steve Dahl hold their big event at Comiskey Park to destroy disco records. And Renee says that night's impact wasn't just about how scary it looked to her on TV. It was bigger than that. Well, I mean, you know, after that, disco kind of becomes a four-letter word. People weren't getting played. People weren't getting booked. The records weren't selling as well. Renee says it happened shockingly fast. In 1979, disco was everywhere, And by late 1980, disco dies. That night at the baseball game became known as Disco Demolition Night. And over the years, a lot of people have said it's the night disco died. It's like pulling the rug out from under you. You have to kind of rebalance. Okay, what are we going to do now? How do I stay afloat? This is Janice Marie Johnson. And she had this band called Taste of Honey that had a big disco hit. Boogie, oogie, oogie. In 1978, the song had gone to number one on the pop, R&B, and disco charts. Sold two million copies. That summer, they were playing stadiums. 80,000 people, outdoor concert, Chicago, singing my song. They won a Grammy Award for Best New Artist. 1978 was a great year for them. Our second album was released in 1979. And I think it was July 12th, 1979, where they were burning disco records. And we had just had a new release categorized as disco. So how does that work for you, girls? (laughs) Not well. By the end of that summer? I'm noticing that the radio stations that I used to listen to have changed formats. And it turned out this was happening all across the country. Just like that. Disco is dying overnight. Taste of Honey broke up in 1983, and Janice Marie switched careers. I drove a limo. Would you believe that? People said, you can't drive a limo. I said, why not? What are you talking about? After a quick break, we talked to Steve Dahl, the radio DJ behind Disco Demolition Night. And Vince Lawrence, the usher we heard from earlier, explains how the place that killed disco accidentally helped give birth to a whole new kind of music. Hi, I'm PJ Vogt. And I'm Alex Goldman. And we host a show called Reply All. It's about the internet. It's about the internet? Don't you think so? It is sort of about the internet. We did an episode where we took tiny amounts of LSD before work to see if it would improve our job performance. We did an episode where we talked to this guy who says he's in jail for a murder that he didn't commit. We did a profile of this woman who says that she is secretly training rats to star in viral videos as part of a plot to change the world. But they all touch the internet in some way. Anyway, it's a good show for people that like surprising, funny, true stories. 
Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Well, it was uh, December 24th, 1978. This is Steve Dahl, the DJ who some people say killed disco music. He's in his 60s now, still making radio in Chicago. And he says Disco Demolition Night all got started because of this crappy thing that happened to him the Christmas before that summer. I had been down on Wacker Drive dressed as Santa. Live broadcasting from down on the street. We had a studio on the third floor, so we would just drop a mic out the window. End of the day. Came back upstairs, and uh, they said, hey, uh, Jack wants to see you. Jack was the general manager of the station, Jack Mincow. Uh, walked into his office, and he had an automatic door closer. Apparently, this used to be a thing. He, uh, he hit, the, uh, hit the automatic door closer, and when that happened, when the door closed behind you, automatically you knew something bad was going to happen to you. So he informed me that the station was changing their format to disco. Effective that night. So I, I, I drove home in my Santa suit and walked in and told my wife that, uh, you know, I didn't have a job. Steve had actually just moved to Chicago, and now he was fired. And he blamed it on disco. Steve says before that Christmas Eve firing, he didn't have any strong feelings about the music at all. He wasn't even really that into music. He was a talk guy, ranted about the news, told stories about his life. And he was kind of a shock jock. He made fun of stuff in pop culture. But after Steve got fired from a station that had turned to disco, the music became one of his main targets. Steve hated that rock artists like Rod Stewart were making disco songs. He thought it was phony, like Stewart was just cashing in on a trend. So he started that band, Teenage Radiation, What's happening, baby? to make fun of disco. I kind of made fun of the Tony Manero and the Saturday Night Fever lifestyle with the white three-piece suit and, mm-hmm. and all that. And when he got a new job on the radio, which happened very quickly, he kept making fun of the music and also started talking about destroying it. So what we do every morning is we blow up a disco record that we hate. This is Steve on the radio in 1979. You're uh, ready to go in there, Shorty. Why don't you go ahead and uh, start it up? He started doing this thing where every morning he would play a disco record. And then... Blow it up. And Steve says his intention with all this was just to be absurd. He'd get dressed up in funny outfits when he played shows with his band. I used to wear Hawaiian shirts. Uh, And at some point, that just switched over to uh, me wearing this uniform and the helmet. Which he says was not intended to seem violent or militaristic. He says a veteran just handed it to him at a show once. None of this is, uh, there's no master plan behind any of this. This is just all like, you know, me just trying to make a living. And his fans loved it. The crowds just started to get bigger. He held anti-disco events all over the city all leading up to that White Sox game on July 12th. And when Steve looks back on that night, what he sees isn't a racist and homophobic riot, the way lots of people have in years since then, but rather a big crowd of middle-class rock fans reacting against the phony Studio 54 Saturday Night Fever scene, saying, Hey, we want to wear our our T-shirts and our jeans, and we don't want to have to... We don't want to have to wear white three-piece suits to get laid. And he says he didn't see the whole thing as a very big deal. And there happened to be smoke and fire because they put too much of a charge in the in the box that blew up the records, and they had too many records in there. But you know, uh, I I don't really think that it was anything other than youthful exuberance. It feels hard for me to imagine that like people are going that crazy just because they don't like disco music. Like what what was going on? Do you think? I get what burning, you know, uh, things looks like, you know, burning records, burning books, whatever. It it looks, I understand how in hindsight people say that it was racist and homophobic, especially based on the identity politics of the, you know, of the present day. But at the time, I it, it never occurred to me because that was really not the intent of it. You really didn't see that, that, that didn't sort of cross your mind like, oh, this might look like that. No. It absolutely, it did not. Um, uh, if in, any, 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 most of the people who make that statement weren't around for the run-up to it. And uh, it was essentially just a harmless, you know, we were having some fun. Now, Vince Lawrence, the usher we talked to earlier, was there for the run-up to that night. And to him, it was not fun. And the people that broke a Marvin Gaye record in his face didn't seem harmless. But Vince doesn't blame Steve Dahl for what happened to him that night. 
He even still listens to the loop. He thinks what happened probably had as much to do with the place where the event was held as the event itself. Vince says the neighborhood around there had a certain reputation. There were stories that you better not get caught in Bridgeport after dark. Bridgeport is where the stadium was. There was a sandwich place called Riccobini's. And I was like, you know, you better not be running or going to Riccobini's after dark because that's on the edge of Bridgeport and you could get your ass whooped. And this neighborhood is what brings us to the last turn in the story, where the place that killed disco helps give birth to this whole other kind of music. Just a quick warning, this next part contains some strong language. Not long after that night at the stadium, something awful happened to Vince in Bridgeport. On my birthday, I was coming home from school. I went to Lakeview High School. And occasionally I would end up taking the Wentworth bus, which put me in the neighborhood of Bridgeport. And um, a teenage boy driving a, I don't know, a pickup truck of some sort, pulled up next to me and said, hey, the fuck are you doing here? And I said, I'm just, I'm walking home. And they said, no coons live in this neighborhood. And you better get the fuck out of here, nigger. And I just took off running. And they drove and they caught up with me and beat my face till it looked like a potato. And I went back to my friend's house and they called the police. And the police came. They said, well, let's drive around and see if we can find them. And funny enough, first gas station, there's the truck and there's the guy who beat me up. And they arrested him. My mother got a call from this kid's lawyer saying, hey, we've got a court date that's going to come, and we don't want to ruin this kid's life. We were hoping that you could forgive this guy. He made a mistake. He's really sorry. Can we work something out and get you guys to drop the charges? And I said, you know, I have photographs of what my face looked like that day. He didn't seem at all sorry. I think that I should go to the news and I should tell the news that what happened in the South is still happening in Chicago, in your neighborhood. He said, no, 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 we don't, we, we, we're trying to make peace with this. I understand that, you know, you were hurt and we wanna maybe pay you for your trouble. And a light bulb in my head just went off. Because remember, I was saving up for my first synthesizer. I knew the price list at Biasco Music by heart. And I very quickly added up what it was going to cost me to get my three favorite synthesizers. And I'm like, okay, well, if he doesn't want me to show up at court, it's going to cost him (laughs) $6,500. And um, we we settled for five right then and there. First, I, you know, actually needed to heal physically. And then after that, I wanted to get my mind right. I was so eager to put it behind me. And I thought that one way to forget about it would be to get on with my music making, which was the only thing I thought about all the time. So that's what Vince did. He bought two synthesizers, And he started writing songs. I made a record not too long after that with my band Z Factor, all made with synthesizers. With those very synthesizers, those very same synthesizers, I went on to make um, On and On. That's this song. Vince made it with his friend Jesse Saunders. And... It is widely recognized as one of the very first songs in a whole new genre of music called House. House is a lot like disco, but stripped down. So everything that's good about disco, the driving beat, the passion, the energy, it's all there. Like get rid of the big bands, the soaring lyrics, the string sections. We just like the part that was supposed to break down. Skip all that drama at the beginning, all the foreplay. I guess I would say that house is to disco 
as tang is to orange juice. It's got the flavor of oranges just intensified and crammed into a little space. It's the sort of evolution of disco. Renee Graham again. As she started writing about music professionally, she watched this evolution from disco to house unfold. The great, late great DJ, uh, Frankie Knuckles, you know, called house music, you know, disco's revenge. Frankie Knuckles is known as the godfather of house music. He DJed at a black gay club in Chicago called The Warehouse, which is why it's called house music. As more and more artists started making this new music, you could see house start to fill in the space disco once occupied. Vince was too young to get into the warehouse, so he and his friends started throwing their own parties, these semi-legal, all-ages DJ parties at warehouses. The energy was insane. It was incredible. You know, just imagine, just imagine you put 1,500, 17-year-old kids in a room unattended with music. <laughs> and these parties started multiplying like crazy in Chicago and in other cities across the country. This is Love Can't Turn Around by Farley Jackmaster Funk, which is a really famous house song. But you probably haven't heard of it because house kind of stayed underground in the U.S. But by the mid-80s, it started its own disco-like crescendo into the mainstream. You start hearing stuff like this Eurythmics song on the radio. Sweet dreams are made of the You'd never call it disco or house, but it's built on both of them. And through the 80s and 90s, you hear the influence of this music Vince helped create and the disco that inspired it in pop music everywhere. This is Bowie in 1983. Janet Jackson in 86. Vogue by Madonna, built to make you dance. It's got the four on the floor beat from disco, the synthesizers from house, and it sounds more like those two genres of music than anything else that came before disco did. And Vince says if you look at the songs that top the charts now, it's still going. All of these new pop, mainstream songs that are favorites of the, the world over are built on disco records or built on house music. Kylie Minogue, Can't Get You Out of My Head. What do you mean? Justin Bieber, What Do You Mean? In We Found Love by Rihanna. And now some of the most popular artists in the world are DJs and producers. Calvin Harris, Diplo, Skrillex, Daft Punk, you can hear house and disco in all their music as they play stadiums in front of tens of thousands of people. So when Vince thinks back on what happened that night in July of 1979, I would say if someone said disco died that night, wow, it's like, okay, um, dance music culture is bigger than it ever was. At one point, it was the favorite of a very small group of people, which Steve Dahl drew affectionate little circles around and scorned and ridiculed. And now it's the music that everyone likes. It's the music of our generation. Hearing Vince say all this, I found myself thinking, like, dance music is kind of right where disco was in 1979. So I asked Renee Graham, the music writer from before, are we like are we going to have another disco demolition night? Is that, is, are we coming up on that? You know, it's not like, you know, in the 70s, you had only so many radio stations. So that's when it became a problem, when people felt like, you know, they weren't hearing this song because they were again playing, you know, Casey and the Sunshine Band. You know, you're not going to have that now. Because people just don't get music from a single source anymore because of Spotify and iTunes and Pandora and all the other ways you can get music. You know, you can listen to music all day and never, ever hear Taylor Swift. You know, I mean, so I don't think there's going to be that kind of an issue where people feel like this thing has kind of taken over. You know, I don't necessarily think the world's more accepting of dance music. You know, I just think that there's a kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, the way music is now kind of segregated. You know, we won't, I don't think we're going to have a, you know, a, a dance music demolition night. Undone is hosted and produced by me, Pat Walters, along with Julia DeWitt and Emmanuel Barry. Our senior producer is Larissa Anderson. We are edited by Alan Burdick and Caitlin Kenny. 
Special thanks to Alice Eccles, Sasha Furra Jones, AJ Cervantes, Giorgio Moroder, Bob Esty, and Jesse Rudoy for putting us onto this story in the first place. Special thanks to Renee Graham and Vince Lawrence, who both made Spotify playlists for us of their favorite dance tracks inspired by house and disco. Check it out at gimletmedia.com slash undone. Undone was conceived in collaboration with our friends at Retro Report, the documentary film series that connects iconic news events of the past to today. You can find them at retroreport.org. This episode of Undone was mixed and scored by Bobby Lord, with additional music by Matt Bowl. Our fact checker is Michelle Harris. If you want to get in touch, follow us on Twitter, at Undone Show, or email us at undone at gimletmedia.com. Subscribe to Undone on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please write a review. It really helps out. We'll have a new episode next week. See you then. Hi, Pat. Hi, Julia, producer at Undone. I have one last song I want to play for you because I was really bummed that we couldn't get in the story. Great. And it's called Disco Duck. Oh, this is terrible. It was a hit, top of the charts for a whole week in 1976. Why were you sad that you weren't (laughs) able to include this? So, like, we just told this story about, you know, how disco died and, like, kind of people killed it. But the other part of it is that when disco had gotten really popular, it also, like, you know, got kind of bad. Disco Duck was, like, the original terrible pop song. Maybe. I think so. You have a different idea of what was the patient zero of horrible pop culture and music. Send us an email. Uh, Or write it in the review on iTunes. That's the best way to get in contact with us, actually. We're shutting down our email address. (laughs) The only way to contact us is via iTunes reviews. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks, Julia. Thanks, Pat. Bye. (laughs) 